Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our la latest series of the LPL evening lecture. Um, tonight's uh, speaker is Professor Eric Asfalk. So, Eric uh, did his undergrad in mathematics and uh, sorry, in mathematics and English at Rice University in, in Houston. Uh, then uh, moved here to Tucson, but first teach for four years uh, in high school then decided it was not enough and, and, this, uh, and went back uh, to the university in grad school here at LPL. I uh, worked with uh, Jay Melosh and Willie Benz in planetary sciences. And then uh, moved uh, as a postdoc in NASA Ames Research Center um, and we worked on tidal disruption of comets and also uh, participated in the G Galileo probe science team, um, which uh, the probe took the, the first image ever of an asteroid uh, while uh, being in route to Jupiter's icy moons. Uh, also then uh, went uh, for, uh, spent two summers in uh, Southwest Research Institute in Boulder, Colorado, uh, where he worked also on the moon formation and uh, part of this work will be presented tonight. Uh, then got his first faculty position at University of California, Santa Cruz, and further on moved uh, in 2012 at uh, Arizona State University, where he got uh, where he chair, sorry, got the position, uh, the Roland Greeley, sorry, chair of planetary science. And then further on, uh, decided to come back to the correct place, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> and, <so, laughs> sorry. and switch from, uh, from Tempe to Tucson, and now is back at University of Arizona, in LPL as a faculty and his group and him working on uh, colli on collision still also mm. and the uh, history of uh, planetary formation and the implication of those collisions and is also uh, involved in uh, studies for emissions and wor uh, working for asteroids and comet exploration and using radar and seismology to look inside these bodies. And also one uh, is currently uh, finishing a, a book uh, called uh, When the Earth Had Two Moons uh, and this uh, for the people interested in more uh, history about the planet formation uh, about our moon. So. And one last thing for the, the students and that get extra credit. Uh, there will be a stamp uh, for the homework sheet at the end of the presentation just outside. So, right. Eric, the stage is yours. Thank you, Alexandra. And uh, who's a postdoc in my group, some of his work will be featured tonight as well. And actually, we had the same advisor. I had uh, Jay Malosh was my advisor, Willie Benz was my advisor. So in the long uh, uh, saga of Willie Benz students, uh, we've come full circle. Um, and it's good to be back. <coughs> so uh, I didn't quite know uh, how to pitch the talk uh, because there's such a mix of, of, of expertise in the room. And uh, so as usual, there's lots of pretty pictures and uh, shored up by some uh, technical detail. And I thought maybe also uh, give us some uh, ideas of you know, what the moon is and what it represents uh, to us. And I love this uh, picture. It's just a, uh, uh, you know, what the moon looks like as you go through one month. And you'll notice there's a little bit of rocking back and forth. There's a little bit of uh, coming towards you and away from you. Uh, and that's what the moon does. It's in a slightly elliptical orbit. <coughs> and so when you look at it, it ha has a slightly different uh, angle towards you, but it never uh, breaks lock on the Earth. We've always been staring at this one side of the moon uh, since uh, time immemorial until the dawn of the space age. Uh, I love this drawing. This appeared in Dave Grinspoon's book, uh, and it's uh, by uh, Carter Emmert, uh, who uh, just has a knack of drawing these things very concisely. But uh, uh, I used to have my students stare at this picture and understand, you know, the Earth is rotating, the moon is orbiting, uh, the Earth is orbiting, 
Venus is orbiting faster than the Earth orbits. Uh, the Venus has crescents, just like the Moon does, because of the way the Sun shines on it. These outer planets, they're always pretty well illuminated by the Sun. And you go into night and dark as you rotate around the Earth. And, uh, you know, this, was, this geometry was known off and on uh, for, for quite some time, kind of discovered uh, in, uh, you know, uh, <coughs> 500 BC or so, this knowledge that the Moon uh, orbits uh, uh, around the Earth, and uh, that knowledge was forgotten. Uh, here, here's one of my favorite views. It's from the Discover mission. It's a uh, climate observ observatory mission that looks at the Earth from the Earth-Moon Lagrange point. And so this is the point in between the Sun and the Earth uh, where gravity is balanced. The gravity of the Sun equals the gravity of the Earth at this point. And so a spacecraft can kind of hang out there with relatively little use of fuel and uh, get a view of the uh, sunlit part of the Earth at all times. And it just so happened to catch the Moon crossing in front of the Earth. Um, you'll notice that that side of the Moon that you're seeing there, it looks different. And we'll get to that in a second. Uh, those who are lucky enough to uh, get on airplanes and travel around or to happen to be where there's a, a ground track of a total eclipse get to see something like this. And it's been speculated that, uh, you know, the uh, um, importance of an event like a total solar eclipse. Now, raise your hand if you've seen a total eclipse, you know, something like that, yeah. Excellent. And, and uh, I, I, it's, been, yeah, it's been said, you know, if you uh, go through the pearly gates and, and, and you haven't seen a total eclipse, you know, you'll be sent back because, uh, you know, it's like you, you, spent, you got to live on the planet Earth and you didn't see a total, total eclipse of, uh, of the sun. And it's been speculated that this might have given, uh, well, uh, you remember from 2001, A Space Odyssey, you know, this is sort of the dawn of man and the rise of consciousness. Uh, but anyway, I've, I've only seen one total solar eclipse in my life, I'm sad to say, but I have seen one, and it was fantastic. And it was um, uh, something that uh, uh, makes, you, makes you think how big you are and small you are at the same time. Here's the geometry. Uh, shrunk quite a bit and you can see that you know the moon's not always in front of the earth it has this inclination to its orbit it has uh, uh, the actual view is down here if the earth is this big the moon is that big uh, the moon's about the size of your little fingernail maybe a little smaller a half a degree in the sky uh, every hour it goes a half a degree in the sky so it's always moving um, but uh, it's 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 off uh, it's it's off the axis of the Earth-Sun plane, and so it's pretty lucky when it just so happens to line up right in front of the Sun and you get a total eclipse. Um, the Earth's tilted, that gives us the seasons. You could have a whole lecture just in this slide. The invention of the telescope uh, around 1600, uh, late, uh, you know, uh, 1607, 1608, uh, Galileo was the uh, probably the best telescope maker of his day, and he pointed it at uh, the uh, many objects, but uh, he pointed it at the moon and obtained the first geologic images of the moon. Uh, Robert Hooke, uh, decades later, using a much better telescope, started to look at uh, 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 regions in much greater detail. And it's cute to note that you can kind of see what Galileo is looking at. You can see Imbrium and Serenitatis. Uh, you can probably see Copernicus. Uh, Imbrium is showing up on his, in, in, on his picture. I, I, I wasn't able to, anybody know where Robert Hooke's uh, sketch uh, is on the moon? The Apennines maybe? But anyway, I was trying to match it. And any of you who've looked at the moon with a questionable quality telescope with very high magnification, you can see lots of stuff. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a, the sky causes a, a, things to burble around. So it's quite remarkable that these uh, kinds of, uh, of pictures were made. But that was the beginning of astrogeology, looking at other objects as uh, geologic entities. Uh, then began lunar exploration and uh, you know, back in the 50s, uh, the space race was in full force. Uh, and I, my personal view is that if it hadn't been for the space race, we might have, you know, ended up in, in global nuclear war. It sort of gave us a kind of like the Olympics. Instead of fighting each other, you go do something more fun and productive. But you're using the same tools. You're using ICBMs. You're using 
uh, you know, all the, all the kinds of technology you need to, to, to destroy each other a million times over, but you're using that same technology to do this. And a combination of uh, Russian and uh, United States missions uh, through the late 50s to the early 60s, uh, continuing into the early 70s with the end of the Apollo missions, um, uh, explored the moon in great detail. Uh, Luna 2 here was the first uh, man-made object to hit, uh, to arrive at another planet. It was an impactor, and it uh, sprang open with medallions from the great Soviet empire, from the USSR. And uh, the uh, um, Luna Cod returned samples uh, f from the moon, uh, uh, small quantities of samples roved around the moon. I, I love the Russian uh, steampunk kind of mission <laughs> style. And... Uh, um, of course, Apollo 11 uh, uh, landing on the moon. Uh, that's uh, Buzz Aldrin having set up the first uh, seismic station on the moon. And uh, Luna Orbiter 1, uh, this was the first image of Earthrise taken from a, a spacecraft. Uh, not everybody was a big fan. Uh, you know, we've just had a, a turmoil at the, at the ballot boxes and, and uh, just wanted to point out that not everybody agrees on everything, even if it's a good thing. And uh, uh, a lot of, uh, there was a lot of, uh, you know, questions about whether spending, you know, tens of billions of dollars at that time was something affordable. And uh, people do the um, uh, uh, calculation in, in retrospect, you know, what did the Apollo landing do to our, our economy? Uh, and it probably injected, you know, a trillion of, of dollars, you know, into the value. You know, it made, it made, the, it made us worth more, uh, sim simple as that. But it's not always uh, an easy question to answer, you know, when is enough enough, uh, uh, especially when single missions now are starting to cost in the tens of billions uh, for science missions. And, uh, and so it's, a, it's not an easy question to answer. Luna 3 in October 1959 was the first uh, uh, spacecraft to go around the back of the moon. And uh, it was a ballistic trajectory. They just threw it out there with uh, basically a big, big old, uh, rocket, and it uh, had no thrusters of its own. It just looped behind the moon and then uh, beamed the data back. What data did it beam back? It be beamed back these images. What was fascinating about this was they didn't have, uh, this was this little side story that I've always uh, thought was uh, 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 remarkable. They, they didn't have radiation hardened film and thermal hardened film. The Russians uh, 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 didn't. However, they kept shooting down these uh, balloon spy craft that were being launched by the U.S. Uh, into the Gulf Stream, and they would fly, I mean, not the Gulf Stream, the trade winds, and they would, uh, uh, they would blow, uh, I mean, the jet stream, and they would blow uh, over uh, Russia, take pictures, and they would be recovered after they'd done their, 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 uh, their imaging. And so they had captured, you know, 30, 40 of these uh, uh, balloon-borne payloads with uh, unexposed film, and they collected this unexposed film, and they used this in their space program. <laughs> <laughs> and they flew up to the moon. Uh, they, they were unable to, they didn't have CCDs or anything of that nature. Uh, the only way to take a picture of the moon was to expose film in a film camera, develop the film in space uh, in a dark room, you know, made to operate in microgravity, you know, in zero gravity orbiting uh, out in deep space. And then once it was developed uh, to shine a light through that film onto a photomultiplier tube, and then scan that, send that data back to Earth. So basically a fax machine in space. So one of the greatest uh, things ever, in my opinion. Uh, and that was actually used for lunar orbiter. Uh, some of the best uh, 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 scientific data from the moon uh, until the 80s was from the lunar orbiter missions. And, uh, and they also used this, uh, developing the film in space and then scanning it and sending it back. Uh, <coughs> Near side of the moon, go to Google Moon, spend hours on Google Moon, go, go to Google Earth, drop down the slider, get rid of the Earth, go to the moon, <laughs> and, uh, and, and there you are. You can like search for Chicago, it'll take you to the coordinates of Chicago on the moon. And uh, there's the near side, far side, near side, far side. Uh, s just uh, scaled in topography, near side has uh, mostly planes. Far side is thickly mountainous. It's about twice the crustal thickness as the near side. And that's why this part of the moon looks so much different. Uh, it's plated with ancient crust uh, twice as thick as the crust on the near side. 
now. Uh, and, and it has a couple of these little black spots that are uh, volcanic flood basalts where lava has flowed out. But the near side is full of these lowland areas that have been filled by uh, volcanic processes that happened after the craters formed. It's kind of a thin, hot lid, uh, or at least it was uh, four billion years ago. And so here's the uh, modern view of the far side. So near side, far side. Two different planets. And so the Maria, you know, the, the man in the moon, the Maria, these were, uh, they're darker because they're flooded in, in uh, <coughs> volcanic basalts that have filled in the lowlands in these craters uh, by a process that's much debated, you know, what's the actual nature of that flooding. Uh, so there was more heat on the near side of the moon. There was more, uh, uh, less topography on the near side of the moon. And so it changed its geology. And this is a different subject, but I love uh, this movie. Martin Yutzi, another Willie Benz student, uh, did, uh, did this uh, simulation of what would happen if the moon and another moon collided in orbit around the Earth. And this is a theory that we put together for why there's this difference. Um, the formation of the lunar far side highlands by the accretion of a companion moon. And, uh, and the reason it looks so different from any other kind of impact is because the impact's very slow. They're both co-orbiting the Earth, and so their collisional velocity is constrained to being no more than about two kilometers per second, which is about a tenth the speed of a cosmic uh, kind of a giant impact. So back to the topic at hand, uh, why do we think the moon was formed in a giant impact? Well, if you go back to the original theories how the moon formed, uh, co-accretion uh, does not work very well. It's completely different geologically, compositionally. Isaac Newton actually uh, weighed the moon. Uh, he wasn't able to do it very accurately. He got the wrong answer. Uh, but uh, he actually weighed Jupiter, he weighed Saturn, he weighed uh, the Earth uh, by his Newton's law, which I don't know if he was calling it Newton's law. <laughs> you know, he had, he had a quite a big ego, but I don't know if he was, a, uh, but he had the law, the law of gravity. And uh, the moon was weighed eventually by the influence of its uh, tidal action on the oceans and, and also the determination of the Earth-Moon barycenter. The Earth, the moon goes around the Earth, but they actually go kind of around each other, around a common point. It's about 1,000 kilometers below the surface of the Earth, about 4,000 kilometers away from the center. And once you know that central point, you know the mass of the moon. Once you know the mass, you know the size, you get the density. The density of the moon is only three-fifths the density of Earth. So it's made of different stuff. It can't have just accreted out of the same pile as the Earth did. Uh, you know, a whole uh, series of theories, uh, uh, probably the most famous of them is uh, uh, by George Darwin, the son of Charles Darwin, who came up with a theory of, of fission. The Earth was spinning so fast that the moon popped out, uh, perhaps out of the Pacific Ocean, leaving the Pacific Ocean Basin. Uh, the, the time scale of geology was shorter then. He presumed, uh, he actually calculated that the timing of that event would have been about 57 million years ago. But the, uh, uh, um, and, and that was, that's because the moon is receding from the Earth by four centimeters a year. And so you go back in time, and, and he didn't know that it was four centimeters a year, but he did the math of how much tidal dissipation would have occurred and how long it would take for the moon to have once upon a time been closer to the Earth. And you rewind that clock all the way back, and you get a story where the Earth and the moon are in the same place at the same time. And that led to his notion of a fast-spinning Earth that popped off the moon uh, with the assistance of the sun. Uh, that theory doesn't really work very well. Although it's actually the anchor of most modern theories, uh, some form of high angular momentum process. Uh, the idea of capture, the moon could have been another planet that got captured by the Earth. And uh, it's really hard because uh, the Earth is zooming through space at 30 kilometers per second. And so some other planet has to be coming along and then just hit the brakes for some reason right when it gets there and get into orbit. And the answer to the problem was like right there in front of everybody all along. Uh, that uh, it, it is capture, uh, it is rotation, it is uh, these other theories, but it has to do with the fact that they collided, and that's what gives them the fast spin, and they collided, and that's what caused the other planet to stop. Uh, it's, uh, they, and, and, and people get to this point where they don't want to go to the, the next step because planets colliding, that's crazy. <laughs> you know, that's nuts. So the lunar samples told us that the moon's volcanic. 
it's a, it's a uh, uh, every rock that they brought back is uh, some kind of igneous uh, rock or a cumulate uh, of, of, of igneous rocks. Uh, some of them are, uh, you know, breccias that have uh, bits that have been welded together by the intensity of large-scale impacts. Uh, they're, you know, melt sheets. They're vesicular basalts that have bubbles in them, uh, regolith breccias. These are the kinds of materials that were brought back. And it ended uh, at once the, uh, <clears throat> the last gasp of those who were thinking of co-accretion kind of processes where, where the moon could be a primitive object. Because what else has a density about three-fifths the density of Earth? Well, primitive meteorites do. And so, and, and what else is dark? Primitive meteorites are dark, and the moon's dark. It looks pretty bright in the sky, but it's actually quite dark. It's, uh, you know, like a black basalt rock. And so, uh, so there was this thought that it could be a big um, uh, primitive meteorite orbiting the Earth. But that was put to rest with the return of these Apollo samples. And, of course, uh, widespread evidence for volcanism on the moon. Uh, this is a schematic of the sort of near side volcanism I was referring to where these impact craters got flooded about three and a half billion years ago. And, uh, and, and it's very interesting when you look at a, uh, a picture of the moon like this one, you can see that these, the malia are pretty sparsely cratered. They don't have a lot of pock marks in them. And, uh, and then the highlands, these white areas, are heavily cratered. And so there's this uh, timing, this chronology you can do from impact cratering, just like looking at an old table, you know, and one that's like got a bunch of dings and bangs on it. That's an old table. Well, there are young resurfaced parts of the moon, and if you do the chronometry and then also do age dating, because you can date samples that are brought back, you find out that some of these melts are in the age of ages of three and a half billion years old. Thanks to astronauts who were uh, pretty brave uh, individuals. Uh, this is a uh, three and a half uh, kilograms of high explosive. <laughs> you know, they just uh, walking around, putting it down, pulling out the safety pins. And that was probably like the least risky thing they did all day, <laughs> you know. Uh, and it's got this, uh, you know, antenna so you can uh, hit the button after you're gone. They didn't want to blow them up while they were there because uh, there's no atmosphere on the moon. And so there's nothing to stop the shrapnel of all these particles flying around. So they laid out this network for a seismic station and then uh, conducted some seismic studies while they were on the surface using thumpers and things that weren't ballistic. And then they uh, uh, hit the red button and blew these things and did seismology. And then the moon also has uh, deep moonquakes as well that were detected. And from seismology, you get a picture of the innards of the planet. And so seismology told us the center of the Earth, that we have an iron core, you know, we have a solid inner core, liquid uh, outer core. We have a, uh, um, um, you know, these, uh, uh, we actually can do seismic imaging on the Earth now where you can see subducting pla uh, slabs going down uh, beneath the crust into the mantle. On the moon, the, the picture is much more, murky. We don't have really good seismic data. We have seismic data, but it's not what a seismologist would really want uh, in the modern day. But we got uh, a good constraint that there's uh, not a large core. Uh, it uh, has to be quite small or else you'd see it. It's surrounded by these little, little moonquakes. Uh, one of the uh, uh, signature pieces of evidence was actually by Lon Hood here at LPL who uh, studied the magnetism of the moon in the Lunar Prospector mission. And as you can imagine, a big ball of iron orbiting the Earth would perturb the Earth's magnetic field. And the amount of perturbation of the Earth's magnetic field measured at the moon uh, would give you a constraint on how much metal is in the middle of the moon. And so that was actually the, the strongest constraint that the moon's core could be no more than about three or four percent of the mass of the moon. So it's this tiny little nugget of iron in the center. So how do you get a planet that's that strange and that's that unearth-like? Um, I like to show the gravity uh, data, not that it has anything really to do with this talk, but it's so cool. Um, the GRAIL mission, it was two small spacecraft that orbited each other and one followed the other. And uh, tiny perturbations in the moon's gravity field would cause one spacecraft to orbit a little faster and then the other one would catch up a little bit later. And they'd keep orbiting around 
and building up this data set of like what's the, if you're really smart, you can invert all that data to come up with a model for what's the mass uh, density profile of the moon. And what's really interesting is the near side has not just this topographic structure, but it has this gravity uh, gradient structure that gives you this pentagram. So if you're interested in the GRAIL mission, just type in lunar pentagram and you get uh, some interesting, you get a lot of interesting stuff if you type that in, but you'll, you'll get uh, uh, <laughs> the, 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 the nature, some of the nature of the lunar surface. And uh, here's, uh, the, this is the uh, near side gravity field. And, and it, just, it, it just gives you a picture that the moon has this lower density crust, gets impacted. Sometimes the impacts uh, just sort of thin out the surface and leave a gravity hollow. And sometimes the impacts are big enough that a big plug of the denser mantle rises up to fill the hole. And now you have a gravity high. And these are called the mass cons. And the moon's gravity field is sufficiently irregular that if you're trying to orbit it really close, like the Apollo astronauts were, and like our spacecraft are, you, you can't just treat it as a, a point mass and just go around and around in circles. You're going to be off course pretty rapidly because of all these different mass concentrations, these perturbations. So what can explain a planet that has uh, no core, a planet that has uh, uh, it's all volcanic. It has a low density surface crust that seems to be kind of floating on top of this denser mantle uh, and something that seems to be devoid of water as well. And we'll get to that in a minute. And it's not quite as true as we thought back in the 80s and 90s. You know, the moon actually has a lot more water, uh, maybe a tenth the water of the Earth. Uh, it's not as bone dry as we thought. But the only one of these explanations that really works is giant impact. And there was a, a convergence of the necessity of a theory that could explain this weird uh, uh, data from the Apollo mission. And then also uh, Viktor Safranov and George Wetherill and other scientists in the late 60s, early 70s, who are starting to understand how planets formed. Planets don't just form, um, uh, Immanuel Kant, the, the German philosopher, he was uh, uh, not as well known for inventing the uh, nebula hypothesis that uh, the solar system formed uh, in a disk around the sun uh, as the gas gathered together and fell into one space. The sun lit up and now uh, anything that's converging starts to spin faster and faster. The familiar, you know, the ice skater holding, uh, uh, holding their legs and arms together to build up a spin speed. Uh, you'd spin out a disk and then out of that disk would pop the planets. Uh, that theory uh, didn't work. You needed some intermediate step. And Safranov, Wetherill, Hartman, Davis, others uh, uh, started to come up with the idea that the Earth wasn't born uh, as it is, that, but there were uh, hierarchies of planets. And planets consumed planets. Planets accreted planets, grew into bigger planets. And the Earth is the amalgam of maybe 10 large planets, like Mars-sized planets. It's about the mass of the Earth. It's 10, 10 Mars masses. It's about 100 moon masses. So this building and building and building up of planets is the process of giant impacts. So there was a convergence of these two uh, threads of ideas. And so uh, um, just sort of a, some, some, put some faces to the names of some of the people who had done a lot of the work. And there's you know, dozens more. But uh, Don Davis and Bill Hartman here in, here in uh, Tucson, working at the Planetary Science Institute, uh, were the first to publish on the idea. And Bill Ward and, uh, and Al Cameron had, uh, had uh, been working simultaneously on the idea that, you remember how George Darwin needed the Earth to be spinning really fast to spin out the moon? Well, that's just an incontrovertible fact that the Earth-Moon system has a lot of spin. Most of it's hanging out there where the moon is. But if you brought the moon back to the Earth and somehow glued it on and brought all that angular momentum together, the Earth would be spinning with a period of about five hours. And they were like, hmm, what could make the Earth spin with a period of five hours? Well, a Mars-sized object hitting the Earth at 45 degrees and sticking would have a five-hour spin period. And so they were approaching it from that angle. Uh, Hartman and Davis were approaching it from the theoretical point of uh, uh, um, you know, planets, you know, how planets would grow uh, in a hierarchical mode. And then you had uh, physicists like Willie Bentz working on uh, 
uh, models for you know how, how you can simulate this. Uh, put in uh, the equation of state of how rocks behave under high shock conditions uh, when they collide, like in the top upper right picture is one of his first simulations. And uh, uh, by the time the <coughs> mid-80s had rolled around, uh, the problem was pretty much uh, in the camp of giant impact modeling. People were uh, buying it kind of hook, line, and sinker. Uh, the 90s came around. It was starting to look like we had almost figured out the whole thing. And then came the Cosmo chemists and uh, they always are the party poopers. <laughs> because they have data, they look at these rocks and they measure these rocks and they know what they're made of. And, uh, and they say, and, and I remember this really vividly, like in the mm, mid 90s or so, there was this you know, growing problem with the giant impact theory. And it's that the moon rocks, you can't tell them apart from earth rocks. I mean, they look, quite, they look different. I mean, you can tell them apart by looking at them. Like that's, you know, you don't see a lot of earth rocks that look like welded regolith breaches. You know, it's a, uh, although you do, you know, it, uh, and then if you find uh, lunar meteorites, you know that it came from space and so it's not from Earth. So, so you have some ideas and then the, if the uh, Apollo astronauts brought them back, you know they came from the moon. So what do I mean that they're Earth-like? They're Earth-like in the sense that um, even though in these models the moon forms out of the planet that hit for basic angular momentum reasons, uh, you know, it, 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 the way that the problem is described, the way that the solution is described in the giant impact model is that something came along and knocked the moon out of the earth and made the moon, but that's not at all what happens. The uh, planet from somewhere hits the earth and gets shredded apart and captured by the Earth. It actually is a capture hypothesis. Uh, Theia, as they call the planet, after the, the mother of the moon in mythology, uh, hits the Earth and gets captured by it. And the moon is the last little remnants of this captured, of this captured planet. That's a problem if you want to make moon rocks uh, that look like Earth rocks in terms of, uh, in terms of chemical composition. A little bit of cosmochemistry. Um, oxygen, uh, earth, silicate earth is about 45% oxygen. It's kind of a surprising fact, but most of what the crust and the mantle of the earth are made of, the most uh, dominant element is oxygen. And so oxygen is everywhere. And so it's not like you can like hide weird oxygen in one place and have good oxygen somewhere else. It's all part of the earth. It's all mixed uh, together. Uh, and the moon has the same oxygen isotopes as the earth. Uh, it kind of ignore what all this says other than that oxygen comes in three flavors, oxygen 16, 17, and 18. The ratios of those three flavors uh, uh, is, is kind of determined when a, when a planet is forming. And meteorites from different places fall off of the earth line. Mars is quite a bit different. And so it's this puzzle. Why should moon have the same oxygen isotopes as the Earth if it's made of a planet that's not the Earth. Here's a, oh, I, I thought I had another piece of data, but it, it's not just oxygen, it's titanium. If you plot oxygen isotopic similarity of the moon versus titanium similarity of the moon, the moon is like right on top of the Earth. It's this, this uncanny commonality. There are differences in other, other elements. But uh, oxygen is very mobile. It's part of, part of, you know, it's, uh, part of the silicate rocks, but it's also part of the volatiles. It's an it's easily mobilized element. And uh, titanium is, is uh, hard to mobilize. It's hard to vaporize. You know, it's hard to, hard, to, hard to distribute. But titanium is very similar as well, but it does different things. So the quandary really is how did the moon get to be made out of Earth rocks, even though the simulations are saying it's made out of another planet's rocks. Following the giant impact, uh, and I'm not going to have any answers, <laughs> you know, uh, but uh, the, uh, following the giant impact, it looked kind of like this. And this is work by Dave Stevenson back in the 1980s when the giant impact model was just coming along. And uh, he had bought the giant impact model. He thought it was a, a grand idea to explore. And, but he recognized that it's not just you make the, the, you hit the earth and make the moon. You hit the earth 
and you make a sheet of magma. They uh, call this the flying magma ocean model because it's this uh, big disk, uh, maybe uh, two lunar masses of uh, liquid rock orbiting the Earth. Um, full of vapor, you know, it's like a 20% vapor mass fraction. So it's kind of this phreatic, bubbly mess. Uh, you know, a lot of work has been uh, done to just try to understand even the physical state of this stuff. Uh, and then uh, as that orbits, it'll eventually coalesce to form the moon. In order to coalesce to form the moon, it has to cool. In order to cool, it has to radiate to space. But it can't radiate efficiently because it's surrounded by an atmosphere, like a flat atmosphere orbiting over the disk. And so it's a very complex problem. And this disk might survive for uh, centuries uh, before it coagulates to form the moon. Uh, it's a race against time because if it doesn't coagulate to form a moon, it'll start to disperse. And so it's not clear. That's one of the cutting edge problems right now is the coagulation time scale of the moon versus the disk spreading time scale that forms the moon. And one of the other big problems in this, uh, in this mystery is it's not easy to get two lunar masses of material out into this disk. Uh, it's really a struggle. You have to turn all the knobs on the models, you know, all the way to the right, you know, to get two lunar masses uh, out there. Yeah, it's, if you wanted to make a moon, uh, half the mass of the moon, piece of cake. Making a full lunar mass moon is actually quite hard. Uh, what it does below, if any of you are interested in uh, uh, a really readable but uh, formidable at the same time, uh, paper on what the Earth was like right after the giant impact. Uh, this is a great paper by Kevin Zonley, uh, Emergence of a Habitable Planet. And, uh, and some things are very surprising, like the Earth has a lot of water. You uh, impact the Earth, make the moon. Now the Earth has a big steam atmosphere. And the steam atmosphere is such an insulating blanket that the Earth can't cool for about uh, uh, something like 2,000 years until the steam atmosphere collapses. And so it's this interesting... Um, interesting paper about what the initial conditions uh, would be like. Uh, Mars, the giant impact into Mars, for example, uh, there's not a lot of water on Mars, so it wouldn't have the steam atmosphere. It wouldn't have an insulating blanket, and so it would cool actually quite a bit more rapidly. So Mars, according to this paper, might actually have been habitable much earlier than the Earth might have been. Uh, Simulations are fun. Uh, this was uh, done by James Guillauchon, who's now studying uh, black holes colliding with each other. Uh, this wasn't ener energetic enough for him, but he was, he was using a, uh, uh, but this is a snapshot, you know, like one hour after the giant impact. And, uh, and you see basically the uh, impactor's core has started to shred, you know, the mantle shreds out the mantle, because core iron is uh, density eight or nine grams per cubic centimeter, and rock is, you know, three, and so something three times the density holds itself together a lot, uh, a lot better uh, than, the, than the rock. So the rock gets kind of blasted off, the iron core keeps going, and eventually they sling into each other. Uh, these are simulations by uh, Dave Stevenson's postdoc, uh, Miki Nakajima. Uh, these are all basically using the same types of uh, physics. You know, there's an equation of state to say what the rock does when you hit it at, at such and such a speed and with such and such an energy. You know, it relates the density to the pressure to the energy of, of the rock. And then you have gravity. Gravity clumps things together into these little proto-moons. Uh, this is called a graze and merge collision because you'll notice that there was the first impact that kind of slowed it down and it came back in for a big shredding, shredding impact that did the rest of the work. So here comes, the, that was the graze. And then here's the merge. And uh, that's kind of key to slinging enough material out there into lunar orbit to make the moon. And so it's kind of, you have to dial in this special kind of collision to make the moon. It's not a hugely unusual collision, but, uh, uh, but trying to get enough mass out there is, is challenging. Some collisions would accrete everything back into the Earth. Other collisions that are too energetic, stuff escapes, it doesn't come back. And so to have it stick around is a real balancing act. Uh, here's some uh, 2D cross sections. Now you're looking at a slice through. This is another moon formation model uh, by uh, Robin Canup did this model in, uh, or proposed this model. Actually, Al Cameron proposed it in 2000 uh, in one of his series of papers. And then Robin Canup uh, looked at it in 2012 as a possible answer for this oxygen isotope problem 
uh, back in 2000, the oxygen isotope problem wasn't really a problem. Uh, but how do you make the Earth and the Moon have the same uh, mixtures of compositions? Well, make the Earth's and the impactors identical mass and identical everything, and then everything has to be identical everything, and voila, everything's half of half of each. Uh, the problem with that theory is that uh, it has to be exactly half and half. You get a little bit off of half and half, and one dominates uh, the the uh, the, uh, uh, the mass balance. The uh, uh, other aspect of this <coughs> problem is that it's enormously energetic because two half planets coming together uh, releases a huge amount of what we call gravitational binding energy. And so, there's, so it's a hotter kind of a collision. And uh, the last thing about it is it's unusual because uh, planets, uh, you look at the asteroid belt, there aren't a lot of asteroids that are the same size, you know, at the big side. There's Ceres that's a bit over 900 kilometers, then there's Vesta that's 500 kilometers, uh, then there's some that are down in there, 300, 200. Uh, and, 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 to find, and then you start to get some that are, that are more uh, similar size. But at the top, things vary by about a factor of two in size. And Hartman and Davis actually thought that would be the case for planets forming as well. There should be this hierarchy of sizes. There should be one dominant object. And, uh, and uh, having two equally dominant objects is very unlikely dynamically. Uh, this is a... Uh, <coughs> one of those simulations uh, where I think there's actually a numerical problem in the simulation because it's very challenging. Uh, it's a fast rotating proto-Earth. And so if you want to get enough material to make the moon, that's actually a really hard thing to do. And one way you can cheat is to kind of have the Darwin answer already. You have the Earth spinning really fast, but instead of just popping the moon out of the Pacific, you give it a little extra kick with an impactor, and then out comes the moon. And that's what you're looking at there. It's a... Uh, uh, Impact-induced fission is what they call it. Uh, the uh, challenge here is that uh, in science, you always have to kind of question your, you know, how did you get to your assumption? The assumption of a fast-spinning Earth, the Earth in this case is spinning with a period of around uh, three hours. Uh, so, you know, 10 times faster than it is today. And you have to ask, well, how did it get to be spinning that fast? Well, giant impacts. Well, how did the giant impacts make it spin that fast? It actually, you actually can't do it. It's really hard because uh, uh, imagine you're making a, 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 a clay sculpture on a potter's wheel and, and you realize you, know, you want to add some more clay to it. Well, that's easy to do when it's just still. But once it's spinning and you try to add clay to it, it's just going to spin off. And that's kind of the analogy for this uh, problem of getting the Earth to be spinning with a period faster than about three hours. Um, You'd always have to be hitting it in the same direction with giant, one giant impact after the other, making it spin really fast. And then one of them sort of is the one that makes the moon. So that problem is, uh, I think it's one of those hypotheses that's incomplete. You know, it's intriguing because uh, the Earth did have some spin, but it's incomplete because you haven't explained your initial uh, condition. Um, And so each of these gives a different uh, ge geology uh, for the final Earth. Uh, the half Earth is the hottest, fast spinning Earth is pretty hot, and then the standard model is, is, is the coldest scenario. So in principle, if you knew how mixed up the Earth was after the giant impact, you could constrain this. And there's some evidence that the Earth is not completely homogenized, right? There's, uh, you can sample helium coming out of different volcanoes in different parts of the Earth, and the isotopes of helium are different. Uh, there's there's some, ev some evidence that there are like parts of the Earth that are different than other parts of the Earth. And so maybe when it collisionally accreted, uh, maybe, when, maybe if, the, if the impact hypothesis of the moon is correct, maybe there's parts of Theia that are like down there in the belly of the moon, uh, in the belly of the Earth that you could actually identify. So don't read this. But uh, I, I, tried to sh I tried to make it all fit. Uh, these are, this is just a summary from a re review paper. But uh, there's eight models right now for, uh, for, uh, the, uh, ex for the kind of giant impact that made the moon. And uh, so before you go home and say, oh, they don't know anything. They can't even decide between these eight models. Uh, the truth is we do know it was a giant impact. That's, that's uh, a fact that I'd, uh, you know, um, uh, as uh, for me, you know, that's as f a fact as certain as, you know, this is a pair of glasses sitting on this table. But the, uh, 
which scenario is correct has uh, we have a lot of work to do uh, ahead ahead of us. There's the standard model where you explain the oxygen isotope problem by making the impactor the same composition as the Earth. If they could be the same composition formed out of the same feeding zone and then they collided, then they'd look the same because they started off the same. So that's, you know, it's good. It's, uh, it's, it's challenging to build a companion planet to the Earth so close to the Earth and not have it just have merged to become part of the Earth. But still, that's a workable hypothesis. Uh, the next one is you have a giant impact and then somewhere in the magic of this disk orbiting the earth you have mixing and diffusion of oxygen and so everything mixes with everything else and then you and the problem with that is you have to mix you know oxygen's half of all the silicate so you have to mix everything uh, completely and to do that without uh, uh, dispersing the disk I don't think that works so that's that's a uh, uh, hypothesis I have problems with. Uh, the standard model, model followed by accreting layers of Earth equilibrated internal disk material. So what that means is you make the moon in a giant impact and then later impacts on the Earth uh, veneer the moon with Earth stuff. So, yeah, so uh, uh, that's a testable hypothesis. It means that the moon uh, is hiding under about 300 kilometers or so of later Earth stuff that got like plated onto the moon. Uh, lunar geologists hate it, <laughs> you know, because they're like, you crazy astronomers. Um, but the astronomers love it because it's what their computers tell them that happened. Um, then uh, hit and run collision with uh, Theia escaping. This is actually pretty interesting because uh, uh, a lot of the collisions are actually not accretionary. And I'll get into these in a little bit. Uh, uh, energetic impact by high velocity icy plutoid. Well, that's interesting because if the thing was made of ice, there wouldn't be this uh, problem because all the ice would go away and there'd be no, no silicates uh, contributed by the impactor. And uh, the problem there is uh, it's a very, very low probability event. It's extraordinarily low for something uh, from the outer solar system to come in and collide with the Earth without first colliding with Neptune, Saturn, Jupiter, you know, Uranus, all these other things that are in the way. So to kind of bypass all those and go boom and hit the Earth is really unlikely. Uh, merger of semi-Earths, we just looked at. Uh, spinning oblate proto-Earth close to the fission point, we already looked at. And then uh, a series of giant impacts. This is sort of the latest contender. Uh, this model, you know, it's, it's like I was uh, talking about how to spin up the Earth. Uh, in this one, you make a little moon and then you add a bit more and the next impact makes the moon a bit bigger with sort of contributing some tiny moons that grow. The problem is they all have to be in the same orientation. So it looks really great on a sheet of paper <laughs> when you draw, you know, then in comes the next impactor. But the truth is impactors come from 360 degrees all around. And, and it's very hard to make that model work in my opinion. Others, maybe, maybe one of you will come up with the, the actual answer. Uh, so the big general problem is, you know, why are all these planets so diverse? Uh, Venus, Earth, they're kind of similar. We have, we have no clue what's inside of Venus uh, other than we do know it has a, um, we know from uh, gravity modeling that it has a core. Uh, the uh, moon has no core. Mars and Mercury are, are completely opposite. And uh, you get down to smaller objects and even, there's even more diversity. And uh, you go to exoplanets and, uh, you know, things are, well, these are just artist sketches, obviously, but uh, there's, uh, there's a huge diversity of uh, uh, basic, you know, the, the bulk density as a function of their radius, you know, kind of a scatter, scatter plot. You look at everything that's not a planet. I don't know what we call them all, but so un, un planets. Uh, they have uh, uh, bulk densities that are all over the map. My favorites are, for example, the, 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 <coughs> Nept the the uh, trans-Neptunian objects, some of them are pure rock uh, based on bulk density that's estimated from satellites that have been discovered around them. They're almost uh, entirely rocky. And then others are almost pure ice. So how do you make pure ice planets and pure rock planets past Neptune? You know, why, why, why is that? And then the Saturn system, uh, ice, half rock, ice, half rock, more than half rock, uh, more than half rock, uh, ice, and then uh, almost pure ice, and then mostly ice. And, and there's no 
there's no real relationship with size, density, distance from Saturn. It's just like uh, whoever made these things decided to make one and throw it out there and make another one. Let's try some of that and throw it out there. And uh, asteroids as well. They're highly diverse. Uh, the one that uh, you know we're heading to, heading or have arrived at. Uh, uh, the first images are back from uh, asteroid Bennu uh, from the OSIRIS-REx mission. And this is uh, a mission headed out to Psyche, which is a big, uh, as far as we can tell, a big metallic uh, object, uh, uh, 200 kilometers diameter. Uh, asteroid Cleopatra is uh, uh, another M-type, uh, probably largely metallic asteroid, although it's hard to tell for sure that something's made of metal because it has a neutral spectral signature. Uh, why is everything so, so different? And the explanation that I'm just going to wind up with here is that um, collisions aren't perfect mergers. Uh, forming the moon, it's like you tried to accrete Thea onto Earth, but you, it didn't work out. You know, you ended up with this extra stuff, and that's the moon. Um, most giant impacts are actually grazing. And, and we carry with us a lot of this idea of what impact cratering is like. Impact cratering, if I'm firing a projectile at the Earth at 20 kilometers per second, it doesn't matter too much if my impact angle is 30 degrees, 45, 60, head on. It doesn't make much of a difference. I'm going to make a big, huge hole because most of that is an explosion of projectile energy. And the Earth is this infinite half space compared to that projectile. So it's, the Earth just has to move out of the way and it makes a big crater. When you start to have impactors that are almost the size of the planet, it's really hard to have a head-on collision. Head-on is defined almost as like 10, 15 degrees or so. Once you get more than about 15 degrees off, which is almost all of them, the average is 45 degrees. So once you get more than a few 15 or 25 degrees off or so, uh, stuff goes downrange. Hence the uh, graze and merge kind of collision for the origin of the moon. And so uh, uh, these are a couple of models by, that Alex did of uh, some of them, you know, sort of showing the sensitivity, like a little tiny perturbation, uh, and you change from capturing and forming the moon to a, a, a bullet that's going downrange uh, and remaining a planet around the sun. And it's this bizarre new planet. So that would be called a hit and run collision. And that's at an angle of 30 degrees. So it's pretty head on, actually. And it just keeps going. These were done by Andreas Reufer, another, another Willie Benz student, um, using uh, 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 basically the same code, same kind of code. So that's called hit and run. Here's uh, partial accretion, where you capture some of the stuff, and the rest of it keeps going. And that's kind of a recipe for, for making some, uh, some odd little asteroids. And then uh, I like this one because you sort of end up, you end up uh, uh, spinning up the core. And what's kind of neat is like the core ends up spinning faster than the rest of the planet for a while. And there's a mystery about strong magnetic fields inside of uh, many, many asteroids. And so maybe like a little, you could form a little geodynamo uh, for a while following the giant, following these kind of impacts. And so Mercury is a hit and run collision. So uh, the same Andreas Leifer who did those simulations, uh, we teamed up to do a, uh, a series of uh, studies of, uh, you know, it's really hard to blow the mantle off of Mercury. Mercury has, uh, uh, it's 70% uh, uh, of its radius is, is metallic iron. Uh, 500 kilometers deep is all the, all the mantle you've got on Mercury. How do you blast off all the mantle? Well, you can hit it with something hard enough if you really try, you know, bring in some, you know, huge object from the outer solar system careening in. But it's really hard to uh, come up with a scenario. But once you come up with something big enough and fast enough, you can, you can blow the mantle off, but it's still orbiting the sun. All the stuff you blew off of it is still orbiting the sun, and it re-accretes all that stuff. And so it's really, really hard. It's like a sticky problem. You know, something orbiting that close to the sun, it's really hard to get the stuff off of it. And so uh, uh, we started thinking about um, can, you, can Mercury instead be uh, the runner, you know, be a, be a, uh, a mantle-stripped uh, Theia, if, if, if you were. Something like the origin of the moon, but it's going a lot faster. And it works out pretty well. It's a very intense... Uh, 
uh, event, as you can as you can see. But uh, here's the the movie of that simulation. And there's a problem with that hypothesis, but I won't I won't get into. Oh, here these are just uh, more movies. I'll, I'll let you tell, you ask me what the problem is with the mercury hypothesis. And so um, there's this quote by, uh, you know, uh, fans of Anna Karenina. Uh, the opening lines of Anna Karenina is uh, every, you know, all, all happy families are alike. Every unhappy family is unique in how it is unhappy. <laughs> and so uh, and accreted planets are all alike. Venus and Earth, they're all kind of the same. They don't really care how they accreted the stuff because they gobbled up pretty much everything. There was, you know, the Earth and Venus together is 90%, 93% of the terrestrial planet forming zone. And uh, Mercury, Mars are these uh, uh, unhappy planets that never got to be part of Venus, never got to be part of the Earth. And so they're un, uh, 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 unique in how they were unaccreted. Uh, it's kind of a long uh, uh, digression to really go into this in a lot of detail, so I won't. But when you think of planet formation, you know, you think of the planets that are out there, especially the smaller ones like Mercury, Venus, the, I mean, Mercury, Mars, the Moon the asteroids, they're tiny fraction of the planet forming matter. Uh, most of it's in the sun, obviously. Uh, and then most of the rest of it is inside of Jupiter and Saturn and Neptune and Uranus. And then in the terrestrial region, most of it's inside of Earth and Venus. Uh, to not have been gobbled up by these bigger planets is really a lucky situation. And, uh, and the analogy is like this army going off to war. This is a, a, a graph. This is, you know, one of the famous uh, graphs that they teach in, in the, you know, how to plot your data so people know what's going on uh, kind of uh, classes. This is one of the most famous uh, um, uh, graphs in all history because it shows the geography of the, ma of the uh, Napoleon's army marching on Moscow and returning. And it shows the size of the army is the width of the line. And uh, you probably had a lot of deserters. You certainly had, you know, a lot of death. And the ones that came back, you can't say that they were like ordinary people. Uh, they had, they either had extraordinary skills or they were extraordinary, extraordinarily lucky, all of them. And, uh, and the same thing goes for the planets that are still out there. Um, so where's Mercury's mantle? Uh, Mercury's flying away. Uh, it turns out that it's, it's going to probably hit Venus once again because they're both orbiting, or if that was Venus that it hit. Uh, Mercury is still orbiting the sun. Venus is still orbiting the sun. They're both kind of on common orbits. The chances are pretty strong that they're going to find each other again. Uh, this is work that Alex is actually working on uh, right now. Probably he's like, actually probably has his laptop open. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, what is the fate of this runner? Does it come back and collide with Venus again? Well, most of the time it does, but often it does not. And, uh, but all the little bits and pieces, most often they re-impact re Venus. Sometimes they don't. So statistically, Venus should have most of the mantle of Mercury. And that would explain why you don't, uh, you don't have uh, uh, re-accretion of Mercury's mantle to worry about. So conclusion about the giant impact, I'd say, you know, yes, it formed in a giant impact. Uh, the timing has gotten to be pretty good based on, uh, um, uh, you know, iso, uh, isochrons, uh, radio isochrons, uh, about 60 to 90 million years after the solar system formed. Uh, and uh, that was the beginning of the Earth. I think you can't really say that the Earth existed before the moon forming event because it was Earth's material, but it got completely rearranged and resurfaced and, and uh, redigested. Uh, giant impact's the only way to produce a silicate planet with no iron core. It's uh, cosmochemically, uh, you know, people have toyed with the ideas, you know, that can you sort of have zones of the solar system uh, that, uh, that process things differently than others, uh, but that's not working. Uh, giant impacts are an intrinsic part of the planet formation process, and there's about six, seven, or eight viable theories. I think the next scientific landmark, uh, if you wait a few decades, I mean, things are happening so fast in exoplanet observations that uh, I don't think it's going to be more than 10 years 
uh, maybe, uh, I don't know, like is JWST going to be able to detect moon-like moons around Earth-like Earths? Uh, the James Webb Space Telescope? You know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's tantalizingly close and, every, and, and, and they always exceed expectations uh, pretty much when you find out that, uh, uh, that there's now 3,000 confirmed exoplanets uh, and, and of those. Uh, um. And so uh, our own uh, latest work, we're actually looking at this uh, hit and run return for the origin of the moon when uh, I mentioned that uh, idea of Mercury uh, because when you form the moon, you could form it in the standard model, but most, all, most of the time, you actually end up with uh, hit and run collisions. They're actually more than, more than half of all giant impacts are actually hit and run collisions. And so if you have a two-step collision forming the moon, uh, you can solve a lot of these, uh, these problems. And that's uh, stuff that, uh, that we're currently working on in, in my lab. So uh, this plot here is uh, just to wax, end on, end on a very scientific note. This was the impact velocity. This is the velocity that the runner escaped at. Like if this was the Mercury forming event, this would be the velocity that the runner is leaving at. It's slower than the impact because it lost some steam in the collision. And these are the, as time goes by, 100 years, 1,000 years, 10,000 years, uh, the velocity, uh, when, it, when it does re-impact the Earth again, it re-impacts at, uh, at, at different speeds that are kind of randomized. But this yellow implies, you know, more of them are kind of in here. So it kind of slows down and the next impact's gonna be slower than the first one. And so eventually you have, you can think of it like a bounce, and then it comes back and the next one's a merger. So that's kind of where we're, where we're heading with our uh, latest uh, throwing of our hat into the ring. So anyway, thanks for your patience. I went a little over. Uh, any questions? The, the simulations are centered on a, on a stationary Earth, but yeah. um, it, it's hard to imagine impacts of this magnitude still leaving Earth and Venus in pretty close to circular orbits and pretty close to a single plane of the ecliptic. Um, wouldn't they be just Halley's Comet sort of orbits uh, left over? You, you'd, you'd think so. It's, uh, in, in most models of planet formation that do this kind of thing, studying the orbits, putting them around, and they, they assume that when two planets hit, they just sort of stick. And that's kind of the most perturbation you could possibly have. Because when you think about it, if you bounce, you send stuff away, it's not as efficient. So even in these perfect mergers, you have, you have a little bit of deflections. You change eccentricities a bit. You'll make it more likely to have a next collision. But you don't really uh, uh, throw things completely haywire. Yeah. That's a good question, yeah. Um, earlier, you you said that uh, the moon is uh, migrating away from the Earth a centimeter or so a year. Is it possible that it could uh, collide with, say, Venus sometime in the far future? And what would that be like? The, uh, the migration slows down as it goes farther because what's causing it to migrate is actually the tides it's raising on the Earth. And the farther away it gets, uh, the less uh, tides it's raising. And so it's kind of slowing down as it's going away. And so it's going four centimeters a year now. Uh, and and as, as the years go by, it'll be one centimeter a year, millimeters a year. Uh, it's predicted that it'll, it'll stop uh, migrating at all. Uh, well, actually, the, the timing, I think, is that the sun will actually explode before you, you get to anything like that. But, but, but if it were to, but it's not, not a bad question because, uh, uh, for example, the question like, why doesn't uh, Mars have a moon? Uh, it, you know, it's, it's, it's the spinning of the planet underneath that actually ratchets the moon away. And so a slow spinning planet wouldn't be able to do it. A fast spinning planet would. Um, you know, the escape of moons is, uh, I mean, it's a really intriguing question, and people think about that the most about Venus. Uh, not, it's sort of the inverse of your question, not what happens when the moon would detach from the Earth and hit Venus, but why doesn't Venus have a moon? And that might be related to the fact that Venus is rotating so slowly. But it's a, it's a deep question, and there's no quick answer to it. 
Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, um, the crater at the beginning, the Robert Hook drawing, is uh, Hipparchus. That's Hipparchus. Yeah, um, and uh, and then I did, this this may be a little off topic, but I'm I'm there was a recent paper in Astrobiology about early uh, early lunar habitability, uh -huh. uh, the possibility of uh, you know one little ponds basically. Yeah, um, and I'm just. So possible surf warm surface water on on the early moon. Uh, do any of the impact scenarios um, relate to, or could they relate to, that um, hypothesis? I, I I don't think initially, like right when you form the moon. I think I think uh, I I mean, there's probably still a lot of water in that big nebula around the Earth after the giant impact. I mean, it's not a you know it's not going to be uh, oceans on the moon, but uh, large comets hitting the moon after the moon solidified, you know, during the waning period of planet formation when cometary impacts were 10,000 times more, you know, frequent than today, uh, something like a 20 kilometer comet hitting the moon would actually create rainfall on the moon. And, and you could have like a 5, 10 centimeter uh, surface layer of liquid water for some period of time. And, and, and you know, if you did that frequently enough, uh, you could build up sort of a hydrosphere for some, for some amount of time. Yeah, I, I haven't heard that particular uh, notion of lunar habitability before, though. But that's interesting. Okay. A couple slides ahead, you had the uh, the pentagram, the mass concentrations. Oh yeah. Um, if 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 you ran that sort of test on Earth, what would it look like? Do we, the do mass we, ha do we have the same sort of mass cons? Oh yeah, the uh, we don't because we're so mixed up with plate tectonics that uh, I mean we do have things that are gravity highs, gravity lows, thing, weird things like that. Um, our average resurfacing time scale is like a hundred million years. Like like uh, when they were looking for the Chicxulub crater that uh, uh, um, extinguished the dinosaurs, uh, there was uh, about a 50-50 chance that they'd never find it because it was 65 million years ago. It would have been subducted uh, in, a, in a plate. And so the Earth has a lot of mixed up uh, gravity signatures due to tectonics. Uh, but, uh, the, uh, but there are you know, a, a couple of holes in the Earth, Chicxulub being one of them that has a gravity signature, Vredefort in South Africa. So there are a couple of these you know, plugs that have, have, they do have mass cons. But uh, the craters of this diameter on the Earth uh, are, are uh, there's only like three that are bigger than, you know, 100 kilometers. Now, you mentioned the, co the composition of the moon and the Earth being so similar, but I remember I guess it was back in the 90s when a lot of this was going on. They talked about the supporting evidence for this was the relative uh, lack of volatiles on the moon compared to the Earth. Is that still hold or? That still holds. It's, not, it's no longer the favorite piece of data because there's a lot of controversy about how much the water actually has. Uh, when I was in grad school, I was taught that there was not a molecule of water in any of the lunar samples. And uh, now there's a paper by Eric Howery, he came out in 2010, where he reanalyzed you know, some of these things that came from the, the red glass uh, pyroclastics, and they're uh, something like 10% water. You know, or their source region would be something like 10% water before they erupted. And, and so a lot of the controversy, like, because you know, sitting on the surface, you devolatilize. And so trying to do the math of how much water was there uh, back back then, but the moon probably has a fair quantity of water. And uh, so that p particular piece of data, it, it's neither really a for or against the giant impact hypothesis because uh, intuitively you'd say this enormously energetic event, of course it blew away all the water, but it's in this big huge disk and, it, and the water has to get out before it reaccretes to form the moon. And so it's not a slam dunk that it explains it. So that's kind of a piece of data that's been you know, it's an important piece of the puzzle, but we don't know what to do with it. Okay, but uh, how about like the more volatile elements like sodium and potassium and so on? 
Now, sodium, the semi-volatile abundances of the moon are, uh, are relatively high. You know, I mean, not, uh, it, it, they get blasted off the surface by, you know, bombardment. And so part of this uh, mystery is, uh, you know, they're not as high as, well, to give you an example of why it's so confusing and poorly understood, Mercury has enormous uh, semi-volatile abundances. If you plot the uh, thorium-potassium ratio for Mercury, uh, which is obtained by, you know, um, uh, 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 for, can be obtained by remote sensing just from, from orbiting the planet. Uh, they match up with Venus and Earth. They don't match up with the moon. And so that was used by the messenger team that had uh, explored Mercury. That was sort of like ruled out the giant impact hypothesis for Mercury, that it had these volatiles. Volatiles are just anything that doesn't vaporize and go away when you heat it. And, uh, uh, and so we don't actually know what all this data means, I think, is what it really comes down to. Uh, if you want, uh, if someone were to come tomorrow and say, hey, the moon has, you know, uh, a water layer, you know, 200 kilometers down, it's uh, like this uh, uh, giant impact modelers would be able to turn the knobs and get it to work, right? <laughs> so that's kind of where we're at. And, uh, and with the hypothesis for mercury having volatiles, mercury has lots of volatiles, including water, the moon does not. They both formed in giant impacts, we think. Why not? And uh, that kind of is one thing that led us to this hit and run hypothesis, actually, because it's a little bit gentler than a giant impact, uh, you know, uh, standard giant impact. But as my friend Hal Levison says, you know, when, when you do computer models, you, you run your models till you get the answer you want and you <laughs> write your paper. <laughs> All right, thanks.